All right, the property prequel. Be in the know before you buy. Uh, another special guest today. Stay tuned for this one by popular demand. Uh, this name's been thrown around, so I thought I'd get the little black book out, found my way to get him here on the Gold Coast. So stay tuned for this one. This one's going to be epic. But firstly, as always, just want to say a huge thank you for all the support for the property prequel podcast. Um, we're getting close, I think, to now two years, um, which is absolutely epic. I, I I just wanted to stay consistent of it. I absolutely love it. And um, I always have my notepad in with, with me because I'm, I'm a bit selfish as well. I, I actually treat these as a bit of learning and growth. So uh, appreciate everyone sending the same messages. They're learning so much. They're growing from listening to the show. So show your support. Um, give it a subscribe or, or a share it to someone just to add value to them. But uh, last week's ep, uh, Jonathan Bell, we spoke around, if you're a tenant, or you're a landlord or looking to buy an uh, investment property, there was some absolute gold there, specific mainly for southeast Queensland. But regardless, I think it was an app that you wouldn't want to miss. So give that one a listen. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, today, we've got the man himself, Ben Handler. So Ben Handler, um, I'm sure you would have seen him around on- online. He's, he's, his face pops up everywhere, to be honest. But the thing I love around Ben, uh, we're going to touch on his journey he actually, I'd say he'd be the the leading um, stalwart for the buyer's agent industry. Um, he's someone I looked up to personally and just a real entrepreneur as well. I know it's a bit of a buzzword, but when this guy talks, um, you know, you really want to absorb what he says. And he's a, he's a guy who's been there, done that. So he's the current uh, founder of the Buyer's Agent Institute as well along with uh, multiple other businesses, which I'm sure he'll touch on his journey. But Benny, mate, thanks for being here. Good to be here, brother. Mate, uh, up from Byron Bay now, is it? Is that home for you now? Yeah, it's home. It's a um, quick drive, mate, one hour. Just, yeah. And it's, it's despite the highway, I know the highway is a bit of a nightmare here, a bit, bit of an ongoing problem, but it feels easy. Straight up. Mate, I, I'm interested to know because I know a little bit of your background, but if we go back, peel it right back to – sort of where you might have grew up school-wise and then we'll end up in Byron because it's a pretty crazy story really because um, I've seen and heard different things. You know, you're in the eastern suburbs of Sydney at one point, like busy ads and now life's a, a bit different now in Byron. So let's talk around the journey very quickly so we can get context. Mate, where did where'd you grow up? Like are you from um, Sydney or? Grew up Sydney in yeah. the east. Oh, so you grew up in the east? Grew up yeah, in the east, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where'd you go to school? That was the stomping ground. So I started off at Cranbrook. Yep. That was pri- the private school there. Yep. Um, got into a lot of trouble. So <laughs> got, got respectfully kicked out of there. Oh, true. Asked to leave very nicely. Yeah. Okay. They were very polite. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. said, Ben, it's time to fucking go. So you weren't one of these, you didn't go, school wasn't like your forte, you think? Like, no, I was just very rebellious. Yeah. Not sure why. I just wasn't fitting into the norm. Yep. So pretty rebellious at a young age, left Cranbrook, went to boarding school at Joey's. So All right. a lot of good footy players go there. Yeah, 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 they um, do. You really like Joey's. Yeah. Re- really enjoyed it. Uh, made some really good friends there and still have some good friends there. So finished up there. Yeah. And then, you know, back into the, the city life yep. after school. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're back out of, ew, yeah. not jail, but it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got your um, get out of jail card. So back into the, the city and yep. then, just did what everyone does, right? Like just or what, what you you think is the normal thing to do is off to university, yeah, off to college or TAFE, yes. wherever, wherever someone goes. So unfo- well, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but fortunately I did follow that train yep. where went to uni, did a Bachelor of Building Construction Property and Management. I think that's what it was called oh, back all then. All right. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. What made you get into that? Like where did that come from? Older brother was doing it. Yeah. And then I wanted to get into – that's what I thought I wanted to get into – yeah. So I didn't put too much thought into it, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just just sort of thought that this is the norm. This is society's norm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, again, didn't put too much thought into it, um, which I think a lot of people also would fall potentially into that into that yeah. bucket. Yeah. And, mate, tell us around the uni journey. Did you graduate? Got to the end of it or? Yeah, completed it. It was, yep. a, it was a tough degree. It was five years, did a thesis. Yeah. It was a pretty intense degree. Like we, we did a lot of like physics back then, which I sucked at. Yep. Just a lot of um, engineering style of work. So it was, um, wasn't an easy, I didn't find, personally didn't find it easy. Yeah. Got through that and then thought, fuck it. I don't want to get into building. Like yeah. I don't want to get into this industry. I looked at the, how, how they pay and the progression. Yeah. I was like, nah. So 
went straight into development, went and worked at a company called Charter Hall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of them. Yep. 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 And what was your role there? So I was, I started off as an assistant development manager. So I was working across Resi and commercial across Queensland and New South Wales. Okay. Brilliant company. uh, Worked for really, really smart people. Yeah. Top of the game. Yeah. Um, So the acumen was slowly, like, that's, that explains a little bit then. You had a little bit of acumen from the start with property. Yeah. My, degree, yeah. my immediate boss, Chris Chappell, like, who's just a gun, he's mm. like the fucking best. And so I, I was under his wing and David Southern, who was a, a director at the time, um, he was a big influence as well. So I was working with some very smart people. One of the founders, Cedric Fuchs, uh, just some really bright people. So I, I really got exposed to um, some intelligence and how – you operate in that corporate realm, yeah, yep. but very quickly worked out, I don't want to be in the nine to fucking five. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. So, because when I think of like the East or any city, you know, it's the, you know, you hear the corporate ladder, you know, you want to climb the corporate ladder. So you're in this job, mate, it's a corporate good job. And it here, like you've learned off a lot of people within there. When was that shift? Like, take me back to that moment where you're like, what what made you think like not nah, the corporate corporate ladder is not for me? Was there a moment, mate? There was a few moments. So I'm a pretty observant guy. So at a young age, I was you know just looking around and understanding. Hey, what's that person's salary? Like you know they're about five years more advanced than me. What's their salary? What's the person who's ten years more advanced? And I'm like, fuck, this doesn't stack up. Mm. <laughs> like this, this is not going to meet where I want to be. What you want to be? Yeah, okay. And no disrespect, though, some of these guys, they're fucking brilliant. But I was like, hey, for, the, for, the, for what I'm worth, for the time that I'm going to give, yep. and for what I can generally give, I need to do something different. So there were some awareness pieces around, at, around, you know, I guess those situations where I was like, hey, I, I need to do something different and take control of my life, mm. my career, if I want to be what I want to be. Mm. Just quickly on that, Ben, because um, obviously knowing you a little bit now, I find you quite self-aware. At that age, though, like a lot of people climb in the corporate. Like, like, where did that come? Like, did you grow up like that? Or like you said, you're quite rebellious. So I'm just curious where that self-awareness came from to realise, no, nah, this is what I want and I'm not on that path. It's interesting, right? Like I was pretty reckless, right, growing up, partied a lot. Obviously very switched on in the sense of like very responsible with where I was going with my career, but partied a lot. Um, you know, did some stupid things. So that awareness I think is, was a bit innate with me. Like I, I definitely had it there, but I was also quite reckless. So yeah. I was, I was fortunate enough to have that self-awareness then because it could have went the other way for me. Yeah. Um, so I guess I just, I, I feel like I've got a natural instinct for business yeah. and I'm creative yeah. and I'm strategic and I felt like when I was confined into a corporate environment, I was actually feeling a bit incarcerated. So there was a bit, there was a part of me which was like, oh, it's feeling like school again. Interesting. Feeling like school again. So I had to break, had to break out. Mate, what's a piece of advice to someone, and I'm sure there's someone listening to this, in that exact moment or feeling, what would your advice be to them? If you can start a side hustle part-time, while you're in something that you don't like and if you're financially strapped and you, you know, you've got some commitments and you can't just eject, get out, I think it's smart to start a side hustle. Mm. It's very big in the States. It's huge in the United States. It's massive. Um, yeah. A lot of these very smart entrepreneurs do it. Steve Wozniak, when he started Apple, was at HP, Hewlett Packard. Mm. There's many more stories of entrepreneurs who mitigate their risk by starting something on the side. So I'd recommend just finding something that you're passionate about, seeing if you can operate part-time and then start to slowly transition. Slowly transition. Yeah, I like that. And mate, where did where did that lead you then? Like, is that where the, the buyer's agency idea came in? Like, how did that all come about? So you, you, you made the call, all right, um, this, this isn't for me. Um, what was next? So... I didn't really know what was next. Yeah. Like, just knew it wasn't that. Yeah. I was just like, fuck the nine to five. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing this. Like, it's just, <laughs> I'm not signing up for it again. Yeah. So that's, that's what I was clear on. Mm. What I wasn't clear on was what I was going to do next. And I think that's the brilliant part of life, right? Like, I think if you're very, if you're, if you leave 
room for things to come into your life, I think amazing things do happen. So if I was set on something, I probably wouldn't have catched this buyer's agent opportunity. So I went to the States. I went to California. I was like, "These you know, a lot of entrepreneurship is in the States, a lot of innovation. I might as well just go there and, and smell it, mm. see what it's like, taste it, mm. be around some different people, some different energy, get out of the tall poppy syndrome here. Because I was already getting a feel for it here. I was like, let's, let's go to the States where it doesn't really exist as, as much as here. And then started to look at the real estate market, met my former business partner there by just coincidence. And then realized that the buyer's agent model was massive there. Mm. Different to here because the buyer's agent gets paid by the vendor. So the vendor, if they pay, let's say, 5% to the selling agent, if there's a buyer's agent involved, buyer's agent and selling agent will split it. Split it, yeah. So I was like, that's a bit weird. Like, it's like you know, if I go to, you know, to San Fran to buy a property and the buyer's agent's representing me, like the vendor's paying the BA. Mm. Like, so I was kind of thinking, oh, that's interesting, but it's big in the States. So it's, it's validated that that model works. It works, yeah. Looked back in Australia and was like, hey, there's some people doing it here. So we weren't the first. Mm. A lot of people think we were, we weren't. But I was like, mate, they're not doing anything. No one fucking knows what a buyer's agent is. That's the yeah. opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And let's charge the buyer, even though they were charging the buyer. So again, we weren't the first at doing that. But I said, let's really flip it on its head, create awareness, scale a business, really give the buyer back some power and let's blow it up. And so that's yeah. kind of how it came about. Then we got back to Sydney and we just started the company. We registered the company. Yeah. Um, I knew nothing about like I'd never run a business, never yep. worked in sales, um, never worked in like in a real estate office. Mm. Wow. So it was a bit daunting, you know, like any entrepreneur. Yeah. Sure, like maybe you jumping into it. Um, but I was jumping into a niche of an industry which didn't really exist. Exist, yeah. So I just believe that buyers needed I, – I just, in my heart, knew buyers needed help. Yeah. That they, you can't just speak to real estate agents all the time. Yeah. So I, I believe that to – I believe that enough to then – Make it work. Give it a crack. Give it a red hot crack. And mate, that business, talk to me around the first sort of, I always love asking any entrepreneur or, or business owner, the first, what was the first 12 to 24 months like? It was really challenging for me. Um, I lacked a lot of confidence. I realized a lot about myself that maybe was a facade before that started to reveal itself when I was in business because mm. I had to show up differently. Mm. And... I, I mean, I sucked at sales. I'd never sold before. Yeah. So I was, I, was, I, was pretty, I was pretty down on that for a while. I was like, man, I just can't sell. I'm sh I suck. I don't have a framework. I'm talking too much. I'm losing business. Um, lacked confidence. Mm. So very quickly what I, what I worked out within that period of time was I needed to upskill very quickly. I needed to hang around certain people. I needed to get coaches. I needed to just get better as quickly as possible and work on it every single day. And that's a commitment that I made. And over time, um, I started to get more confident, um, but I made so many mistakes and I still do. And I guess I just, over time, started just to incrementally improve. Mm -hmm. And we validated the business model quite quickly though. Yeah. So that gave me some confidence in actually the, the validity of the business. Going the right way, yeah. But for me, it was, again, getting back to your question, it was, it was very challenging for my, probably the first three years for me. Mm. Um, a lot of self-doubt, mm. a lot of fear of failure. Mm. Um, a lot of people were telling me I was going to fail. That's the thing. So a lot of real estate agents that we were, were aware what we were doing in the East were basically saying, like, what, what, the, what are you fucking doing? Mm. Maybe they were projecting their shit onto me because they thought we were going to steal their buyers yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of agents were telling me I was going to fail. My dad said, y your model's stupid. You know, I used to speak to my dad about a lot of business. He's like, mate, your model's fucking... Who's going <laughs> who's gonna to pay your retainer? Like, yeah. So he was telling me it's not going to work. Agents were telling me it's not going to work. Um, and a lot of people I was just talking to were like, we don't understand this. Seems weird, yeah. So up against a lot of that. Interesting. It's quite inspirational when I think about it, obviously knowing where your business ended up going to uh, over the next few years. But hopefully that provides a bit of inspiration because we're going to the next part of the journey. Just hearing that there, like... Sounds like obviously anyone who is maybe receiving feedback like that at the moment where they might have an idea or a passion and they are getting knocked back from people who are closest to them as well is a common one that people hear. So what I'm hearing is sounds like your vision was pretty strong or, or 
or was it something that the more confidence you got, the more you just blocked out the noise and just kept going? The vision was strong. The beliefs, the belief system. I, I was yeah. like, in a, I was in a mindset where like, you have to run me over for this not to work. Yeah. Like, you're going to have to kill me. Yeah. Like it's working. Otherwise yeah. run me over. Yeah. And people, I always say, especially to new buyers agents, people weren't signing up with me because of my experience in the first year. I didn't fucking have experience. I was a young punk. Mm. Like I didn't know a lot and I'm, the, I'm, I'm happy to admit it. You know, I'm not going to sit there saying I did. I didn't. So then you got to ask, well, why was like our first client was a very astute guy. We signed up Curtis, very astute guy, very smart guy. Um, he was buying a property for his son. He was a property developer, very sharp. He wasn't signing up with me in my opinion, because I'm like this experienced guy. He's signing up with me because I think my belief in what I was doing was astronomically high. Yeah. And he knew that I was going to do whatever it took to get him the right result I believe that's why he was investing in me. And, you know, like you'd invest and I'd invest in a company, you're investing in the founders. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people just saw my why. Um, they felt my why and they invested in my why. Mm, love it. So what I'm hearing, it, it relates to a quote I really love. It's like, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. So it's, it's sort of what I'm hearing there is your belief within your own internal self was – all that mattered really and that will project onto other people right yeah but it was an interesting one because like at the same time like i had so much self-doubt mm. so much fear of failure mm. um but it it worked it worked love it and then give some tips there because obviously what a buyers are not obviously representing buyers so obviously we get a lot of home buyers listening in on this this podcast which we're really grateful for obviously want to be more in the know before they actually buy. What did you notice getting some traction in the business, working with a lot of buyers? What are the key roadblocks you feel that buyers face as they come into that journey of, of home ownership? First one is self, lack of self, lack of self-awareness. Mm. So they think because their mother's brother's sister's husband told them to buy in Burley, they should buy in Burley. Mm. That's where they should be. Mm. Um, but they don't realise that's maybe not where they should be. Maybe whether it's an investment property they're buying or whatever's going on. Um, I feel like they get influenced by a lot. Yeah. E.g. what's in maybe news, um, what friends are telling them, yeah. maybe what some trusted advisors are telling them. So I think um, there's a lack of self-awareness around, I guess, what they really should be doing. Mm. Um, so there's there's a lot of influence that I see. Yeah. Um, so I think people need to first and foremost get very crystal clear on what they want, not what other people want for them. For them, yeah. That's a good one. I see a lot of people buying investment properties in areas because their friends, Someone sisters, husband said, said, buy there. Yeah. And they go and buy there. Yeah. yeah. Um, or because it's close to their home. Yeah. And, they, and so I think, um, yeah, I think there's some mistakes made there. Um I think a lot of buyers as well give too much information to real estate agents mm. and good, good on all the real estate agents out there, man. Like they, they know how to work buyers and they do their job really well. A lot of them. However, what tripped me out was that these buyers like would tell real estate agents everything. Yeah. But what they don't realize is the real estate agent is working against them. Yeah. They, they've, they signed up a vendor or vendors and they're obligated, like their duty is to get their vendor, their client, the highest price. But buyers will go in there and say, oh, you know, I've got this, I've got that. And then what I think buyers also don't realise is that the negotiation doesn't start when you put when in your you offer. Put in the offer, it's, yeah. It's that first phone call when you call up the agent, you're like, oh my God, we just noticed you listed 12 Smith Street. And the agent's like, man, I fucking got this person. <laughs> I can't wait till they come in. <laughs> and they come in, they're like, oh my... And then they don't realise the negotiation's already started and they've lost or they're losing. Good point. So I think they need to be very um, careful. And just be mindful, right? Yeah. Just be mindful. Yeah. yeah. And how they communicate with agents and these agents, they're fucking excellent at what they do a lot of Yeah. Them. No, it, it's, a, it's a good one, isn't it? And I always say this to a lot of people as well. I used to actually work as a sales agent. So obviously as a buyer's agent now, but when I was a sales agent... Good sales agents are good at what they do, right? And the good sales agents are trying to create, obviously, a win-win for all parties. Like, it's not like savage, oh, we want the takedown buyers and all this and that. But I always tell people, when I was a sales agent, we used to do training 
like lat- literally live training scenarios of all right you got three buys pre-auction how you're going to pump up the offer of buyer one like what dialogue are you going to say to buyer three to um you know all these little negotiation sort of tactics real estate agents train for that which is epic that's awesome that's that's their job but you're exactly right i guess it's just being mindful that good agents out there um they don't want to rip off buyers or get the work like you know but that they are good ones are doing their job and they're, they're paid by the client right and a good person at their job any industry will do some training on how to be better yeah i think you're right like good real estate agents work for their vendor they don't work mm. for the buyer yeah and a, a good real estate agent is going to get their vendor the highest price mm. and if that comes at the cost of a buyer's neglect like just um lack of awareness yeah um yeah it comes at it a is cost what it is yeah I think another thing is product knowledge. I think a lot of buyers lack product knowledge. Um, I think it's a good one. A big one for uh, I think a big reason to engage a buyer's agent like you, for example. Let's say you're buying in Burley. You've walked through more doors than the standard buyer, mm. and if the standard buyer's in the market, let's say for three months, like how many doors are they really going to walk into really get a good taste for product knowledge? I'd say it's really limited. Mm. And so I think that a lot of them lack real product knowledge. Yeah. And that's why they make bad decisions as well. Yeah, very true. Just a quick one for the owner occupiers right now. So owner, someone wanting to move into a home that they're going to live in, maybe raise a family, downsize, upsize, whatever. There's an emotional attachment. Your experience as a buyer's agent representing these types of buyers, what's three key things you could pass on some wisdom to some of these owner rocks to be mindful of to go out there and and do if they were to do it themselves what's three key things you could give to owner rock buyers in 2023 you feel to to make a, a good decision with yeah with buying yeah i think the first one is they've got to again go back to my point around careful how much you communicate to the real estate agent Obviously, you want to you want to let them know what what they need to know to help you get a result, um, but you want to be careful around giving away too much and then showing your emotion too much, yeah. which means you'll get typically screwed on price if the real estate agent's good. Yeah. Um, number two is don't rely on just real estate and domain. True. A lot of buyers they just show up every morning online and they think this is the stock that's in the, this postcode or postcodes and. They just rely on that. They don't realise there's pre-market sales going on. There is off-market sales going on. There's there's post-market mm. sales going on. And I think it's sad that some buyers literally will just rely on what's mm. available online. Mm. Sometimes buying off-market and pre-market, as you know, it's not great. Yeah, Not always the best solution. But I think a lot of buyers just rely on what's online. True. Number three, in the time that they're in the market, they want to try and develop good rapport with some key agents who have the most market share. Yeah, good point. They want, to look, they want to look on real estate and domain and look at the agents tab and they want to see who is selling the most in these, in these suburb or suburbs, which agents have predominant market share and just really just stay on the agents. Mm-hmm. Stay on them, stay on them because they're going through potential opportunities every day to list. And if you're top of mind, you most likely as a buyer will get the call. Mm. Very true. I said this to someone, someone messaged me and asked, I did a video and they're asking, what did you mean around being proactive buyer? Like I'm struggling, I've been looking for a while and like there's proactive buyers and there's reactive buyers. And I feel the proactive ones do exactly what you said. They're getting to know some of these agents and not just on a weekly, but like on the daily, you got to put in the effort to build this trust and rapport with some of these agents to get, uncover those opportunities that, the everyday buyer doesn't get access to, right? So that's the difference, I feel. The the ones especially owner ox and things like that, you need to be really proactive rather than, you're right, just relying on what's given to you on your lap, right? You need to go out and find and, and yeah, be hungry as well. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a good um, point you bring up. I think a lot of them are reactive. Reactive, uh, what, yeah. what that means in, in my eyes is they wait to wake up every day and look yeah. at real estate and domain. That's reactive. Yes. You're reacting to what's on. Yes. And so I also think in addition to what I'm saying, timing of when to buy is important. Like I like mm. to buy property for myself around June, July, mm-hmm. December. Most people, 
in the in those times are away switching off yeah cooking barbecues or in winter they're they're, they're in they're in <laughs> they're thailand in, yeah, yeah. they're in europe they're in greece <laughs> key agents are in greece junior agents are there they just want to sell i think timing of the year is also important around when to kind of snag some some deals mm, love it love it and just on that mate just a quick one as we um as we close up sort of that buyer's agent chapter because mate it, it's so cool seeing the business scale and you start to build your acumen on you know that what what develops a really good buy mate it sounds like you took those skills then because this is something i'm really passionate about is there's a lot of people real estate agents buyers agents any sector listening as well you then utilize that wisdom to obviously build a business but then you've also applied that in your own life with buying property can you give any insight into i guess what what did you feel the the strategy that really um pushed you forward with your own property portfolio like what was there a certain strategy that you really fell into or um how did you amass a, a portfolio over time at the start like if you could peel back to the start where do where do you feel you gain the most traction building your own property portfolio for me it's been capital growth focused yeah and getting back to my point earlier in the chat around not following someone else's what you know strategy or what they think is important like a lot of people have been saying hey over years to me like cash flow positive even back in my early 20s cash flow positive but i started to earn good cash at a young age so i had a good ca- level of cash flow cash in bank so that wasn't the right strategy for me so i started off very early just focusing on cap growth didn't care about whether it was positively cash flowed or not typically it Typically, in most cases, it never was. And I was focused on upside. I'm always focused on upside. I'm always focused on trying to project years and like maybe three to five or even seven years, thinking about how can I also manufacture this equity? So how can I actually then do some work, whether it's cosmetic or structural, and buying in a really good blue chip area? So my strategy has always been blue chip, highly desirable area, where there's not a lot of um, infrastructure that can be built Mm -hmm. Um, and just trying to really find good quality assets. And I've made mistakes before, but um, we we bought in Byron last year. We bought an area called Cooper Shoot because it's blue chip. Um, And we spent five months researching, Rach and I, Cooper Shoot. Mm. Like, so we, 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 we took our time to be like, let's learn the streets, let's learn what's going on. Let's meet the agents. Rach was taking leadership with the brief and so she with, with the um with the transaction. So she developed some very good agent relationships. Yeah. Work the agents, work the agents, like we're talking about, work the agents. Worked one in particular from McGrath. Door knocked for us. Bought off market. Perfect property. Mm. Took five months. Took five months. Love that. Very proactive process though. Yeah. 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 And and like I love people giving people insight because people do think when it's time to buy a property, you just, yeah, again, you just sit back and see what's available online or, or, you know, if you want the results of the top percent in the property world, they're all proactive. Like me and you both know of some really good investors, home buyers who are gun at what they do and have built for themselves, like a mass huge portfolio. All of them are proactive as like they're just onto it. With, with everything so that's that's an unbelievable insight i just heard you say there quickly on blue chip why did you always go with blue chip property for your own portfolio i think a lot of it had to do when i was at cohen hand there are a lot of these, these very high net worth these these wealthy individuals we were dealing with mm. were buying blue chip mm. and i just saw a trend like these guys were incredibly wealthy they were all buying blue chip. All of them. Like it wasn't, I didn't see one of them not. Mm. And so I just started to see the dots connect. It's like, these dudes are all doing the same thing. Mm. Like I know there was one guy just bought everything in Bondi Beach. Mm. Huge portfolio. There's only one Bondi. Mm. And, you know, I just thought there's a, there's a, there's a method to this and it suits my, my situation. And so I've always focused on that sense. Mm. And it's a good one, isn't it? Like people always talk around the whole blue chip mentality. And I sort of peel it back a bit. And it's a a lot on that 
owner occupier appeal as well, right? Like if you're buying in areas where it's heavily investor focused, you know, the the mass market in that market is um, a lot of tenants, you know, a lot of turnover. Um, tenants don't keep their house upkeep as much. Whereas when the owner ox are in an area where it's predominantly families living there, more house proud, more of the infrastructures in there, it's always sort of denser as well. Yeah. Um, land, you know, it's very land banked in, no supply. So you can just imagine if you're an investor buying in blue chip, some of these suburbs, you hold that over a certain amount of time. That's what's really going to skyrocket the growth, right? And it sounds like that's what with your focus, the capital growth you were looking at over the long term. Yeah. Like for example, we bought a holiday home, uh, about an hour South of Byron. It's in a place called Angari next to Yamba. Super small place. It's got, it's blue chip. It's got like, I think 94 homes. Mm. Nothing sells there. Very regular, um, irregularly just home sell. So we're like, okay, nothing's being built here. Things don't trade a lot. I think the, the owner of Billabong has a home there. He lives in the Goldie, I believe. Um, again, blue chip. Mm. Um, not, not much trades. Mm. Obviously I bought there as well because of the surf. Yeah. Good surf. But yeah. um, yeah, I just like to look at those places. Cooper shoots the same. Not a lot trades there. High demand. Um you know, close to town, it's 10 minutes, but then you can have like 40 acres there. Mm. So I was like, okay. And so I just like to look at the landscape and just, you can work it out pretty quickly. Yeah. Like yeah. you don't need to look at, run, look at all these spreadsheets and read through 50,000 research papers. You can just look at it on paper and be like, this makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. hundred percent. And mate, this now leads, so we've gone, like, it's a really interesting story because you've sort of gone down the path of, all right, leaving the nine to five, you know, this isn't for me, the corporate ladder. Started a business, so you've you've put the entrepreneur hat on and you fell into, I guess, buying property professionally for other people, taking those skills and then applied it to building your own portfolio to, to amass a property portfolio and help sustain the lifestyle you want. But then where did this come into, you decided, all right, I want to teach people how to teach others to buy a property so but the buyers agent institute is what i'm trying to apply to so um yeah just give us an idea on like where did that all come about so firstly i love business i've always been fascinated with business like super fascinated with it like just always researching different models different industries hanging around different form of entrepreneurs like i love business i think it's i think it's fascinating so i've always been fascinated just with business and then when I was a Cohen handler, we started the business in 09. I exited in 18. The industry didn't really grow. Like I kept thinking, fuck, all these real estate agents are going to jump in. We're going to get pushed out. All this like, I just thought that the industry was going to transform, but it didn't. Like when I left in 18, it was, I thought it was still pretty small. Mm. I reckon there's about 1,200, maybe 1,000 agents in Australia. So the Institute was born because I was like, hey, let's grow this industry. Let's create more buyers agents, number one. It's going to be better for us. And it's going to create more consumer awareness because consumer awareness back then was in 18 was still very low mm. in my it's opinion. True. Yep. Very different to now. Yeah. Very different. And then I was like, hey, this could also be a fucking great recruitment strategy potentially for us. That was like the second thing. Thirdly, I wanted to show people how they can get out of the nine to five. I wanted to show people how they can plug out of where they're at and do what I did. Like I plugged out of a nine to five, started a BA business and my life changed. I was like, I know how to show people how to do this. Like I'm confident I can do this. So the Institute like covered those three areas. I was on the phone with my business coach, Simon Reynolds at the time. I was in San Fran. I was in a hotel room. I remember I was on the bed and I was like, this is dude, what I'm thinking. And I think one of the great things about a coach is like sometimes they just give you a, an idea. Yeah. They tell you a book to read or something. And so he, he's like, hey, have you thought about doing a, an online program and show people this? I was like, no. Started the Buyers Agent Institute. My first customer was a guy called Trent Iverson. He's now a selling agent in the Hawks where he does buying agent, agent work as well. He had a very successful dog walking business. Came through my program. He started getting results. I started seeing more. I was like, man, this is, this is sick. Like I can scale this, create 
in my, from what I wanted, more impact. Mm. And I can help more people. We had like 60 people or 70 at the time at Cohen Hand. I was like, man, I can help thousands. I was like, I'm all in on this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's really a platform that I see. It's not just about creating buyers agents. It's about helping people transform. And like even someone like you, like just watching people just bring their expertise to, to the table and just create something fucking awesome mm. and just build something that they want to build. Mm. Mm. And how has it been going, I guess, in terms of what do you've noticed from when you kind of left the, the buyer's own industry helping other people buy? Like, what are you seeing the trend at the moment with professional buyer's agents versus real estate agents right now in 2023? It's a very different model. So I've learned heaps just being in this space, working with so many different business owners and getting exposed to their investment strategies. I've, I've learned a lot about different investment strategies. Um, I have been proved wrong a lot. Like I feel like there's some people I'm like, oh, I'm not sure this person's going to cut it. Like, mm. should we let them in? Like, you know, oh, I'm not sure that they're going to do well in this. And then they just smoke it. They'll do seven figures after two years. I'm like, oh, there you go. Like, mm. and so... I've really started to understand the potential of people and I think getting back to the question around compared to real estate agents, I think it's a very different model. And what I mean by that is like some of these investor focused BAs work from a laptop and computer, like laptop, computer and phone. Mm. Like they run their business remotely. Mm. It's a remote style of business. Mm. I think it's very different. It can be very different to the sell side. So I think a lot of people, whilst you've got to work really hard as a buyer's agent, they want a good lifestyle. Mm. And the difference to real estate, I think on the sell side from what I see is you've got to be there with vendors, with buyers, at opens. If you're not an owner rock focus BA, as an example, you don't need to do that. Mm. So, yeah, I see it. The prospecting's different as well. You know, we're not speaking always to vendors. It's B2B focus very heavily. Mm. So we're dealing, as you know, with mortgage brokers, with accountants, with financial planners, with relationship bank managers. So I think it's quite expansive around how you can prospect and where your prospect can come from. Mm. And how, how do you personally feel around the impact of the aid, like the buyer's agent kind of sector? Like obviously it's, it's grown. Like you've obviously played a part in that to a degree. How does that make you feel? Man, I love it. I think like that's why I got into this space in 09 because I, I saw – the importance of creating more consumer awareness and, and mm. just helping buyers. Yeah. That's why I started. I didn't start because it sounded fun. I was like, hey, I care about this. Yeah. So being a catalyst behind growing more BAs has been fucking amazing. Um, some people don't like what I do who are in the industry, who have been around for a while. They, they don't like that I'm basically creating competition. Mm. They don't like that um, – I guess I'm helping people enter into the industry quickly. Um, but you know, everything I do, I operate with good ethic. I've got good intention. Um, I'm confident with what I can do in terms of how I can teach people. I've been in the trenches and run a business doing this. So mm. I just go back and just know, know that, Hey, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Mm. And the industry is growing and I think the industry needs to grow. I think it's very, um, out of proportion, the amount of real estate agents to buyers agents. Yeah. So I think there's got a, I think there's a long, long, um, I think there's a long, like a, a lot, a lot of growth that's left. Yeah. It's it's still blue ocean in my opinion to some degree. Like, mate, it's crazy. Like, I reckon I get dead set three three to five DMs a week asking around thinking of wanting to do what I do because they you know they watch my stuff or um, they're just inspired by it. Um, some of them have got experience, some don't. And I'm, I'm talking on the weekly these amount of people what's your take for those sorts of people working with so many buyers agents at the top of their game across australia and you doing it yourself if you were to label say five key characteristics that make you feel make a quality buyers agent what would those be so let me just peel that let me rewind and sh shift back one gear okay so i haven't got clear data on this but and you're an example of this if I look at a lot of the really successful BAs that have come through the Institute, like you're, you're, you're one of them, right? A lot of them have never run a business, right? A lot of them have 
never worked in like serious sales. Like they, like they might have had a stint in sales, but their background is not sales. Like they haven't like left uni and then just – or got left school and just worked in sales their whole mm. career. A lot of them have, I'd say, limited experience in sales or no. A lot of them have never run a business. Like they're the top performers um, that I've got in my group. Mm. Some of them are doing over five million a year, right? Mm. And that's only within a few years, like th- maybe two to, th- two to three years. Um, but getting back to your point, right, the five characteristics, right? I think number one is they've got to have like, I feel like a savage mentality. They've got to be like a savage. And what I mean by savage is like they love getting told no, they're going to get back up when shit's tough and they're just going to make it work. Yeah. Like I call it the savage mentality. Like the, it's just going to work. Mm-hmm. No matter what, it's going to work. Yeah. Despite how difficult or slow it's going to take, it's just going to work. So I think savage mentality um, is a really big one. I think number two is they've got to be super, I think, passionate about property. Mm. A lot of people yeah. just, oh, like real estate, shiny shoes, shiny teeth, cars, yeah, watches. If, if, if that's what you're expecting and you don't care about property, I think you're fucked. Yeah. Even yeah. if you make it work, it's going to be a grind. Yeah. So I think you've got to really... Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I think you've got to enjoy property, number two. Um, number three, like student mindset. Mm. The people that I see who do really well, they're just always like, you know, like you, like what can I learn, what can I learn, what can I learn? Like embrace humility, just very much open, open book, okay? Um, number four, I think that if you don't come from a sales background... I think it's a. Re- I think it's, from what I can see, it's it's great. If you come from a sales background, I feel it's hard to reprogram. On our side of the fence, because we're more of a trusted, you know, it's more trusted on the buy side. You've been on the sell side, I haven't, but like it's more consultative. Yeah. So if you don't have any harsh um, programming of sales, I think it's easy to start fresh. Um. I'd say like they're four out of the five. I mean. I think like another characteristic that I do see again that is pretty um I guess predominant throughout all of them is like they just got a winning mindset as well like they love seeing people win mm. like they're not mm. they just they it's like an abundance like they love seeing other people win and they get amongst and they're congratulating their peers they're interacting with their peers and like they're you know they're not just so closed off yeah. So I see that as another characteristic that they, they love seeing people win collectively. Yeah, that's, that's unreal. Really good point. And then on the flip side for that, what's maybe one or two things where you see people not succeed that they should be doing or any maybe characteristics on that front who aren't where they want to be? I think the big one is they get stuck in their own head. Mm. They just get stuck in their head. Yeah. They say when you're in your head, you're dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always tell people, we're not Elon Musk. We're not shooting rockets to Mars. We're not fucking coding, like left yeah. brain. Like we're in real estate. Yeah. Like it's not rocket science. Mm. And so I think what really restricts people in real estate is, is their mindset. Yeah. So I think a lot of them just get stuck fully in their head. Yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest one. Um, it's gold. I think number two is um, comparison is the thief of joy. Like they, they're, all they're doing is comparing yeah. their chapter one to their other person's chapter 10. All they're doing is comparing every day. Yeah. And then their energy and their productivity and their time throughout the day, just looking at other people. I think that's, that's, that's a common pitfall. That's huge. Actually, that's gold. Love that. That's unreal insight. Lo- absolutely love that. Mate, as we wrap up, just a really quick one on, um, we don't have to go into it, but mate, I know you're doing a lot of other businesses and whatnot entrepreneurship for you and you know the way you think a bit different you said you like to go against the norm mate what do you tell me about like each day like how do you charge the charge the batteries up like what do you have any habits or routines that get you in this kind of um this mode that you you sort of walk your life in anything that's really changed your life Ice baths for me have helped. I know everyone talks about them, but for me, the dopamine from ice baths, it resets me. So I I typically do it throughout the day when I'm just feeling a bit triggered or Mm. a bit low. Like I'll time the ice bath around when I need a reset Mm. because it really helps me in that regard. That's been a game changer. How many minutes? I typically, I don't time, but I typically, I think it's around three to four. Yeah. I'll do it around three to four times a week. Yeah. Um, 
I feel great. That's why I do it. Mm-hmm. I Every day there's waves, I'll get waves. Like yeah. I'll surf. If, if, if in the morning there's waves, I'll first thing I'm up, I'll be up at like 4.35 and then at 6, I'm, whenever the sun's up, I'm getting waves. So having a hobby mm. has been a game changer. That's I never used to have point. a hobby. I used to be addicted to work. Had That's no hobby great ever. Point. So I think having a hobby has just been critical to – me getting through the day. Um, I do breath work. Yeah. I do alternate nostril breathing. Okay. Um, I do Kapal Bharti, which is another um, an exca- exca- um, inhalation through your nose. Yeah. Um, and then I do like an alternative of like a, win- a Wim Hof. I've never done Wim Hof, but I yeah. think I believe it's like an alternative to his. Um, and mate, I, I, throughout the day, I just try and be present as much as I can. Like I just, I started meditating again recently, um, but I just try and throughout the day just be as present as I can mm. all throughout the day. I just try and just breathe and just conserve energy. Mm. Um, I don't like to have appointments with people who are going to drain my batteries. Mm-hmm. So that's a no. Anyone who I think, I think is going to drain the battery. I just say no. Mm. Um, so I'm pretty ruthless on who I let in and where I give my time. That's probably yeah. a really big thing throughout a, the day. That's a good one. And how does that differ from your, your time maybe in the east when you said you didn't have a hobby workaholic kind of thing like do you feel question do you feel you can have what you have there like the balance and, and you know, it sounds like you're doing a lot of self-care as well and still have a you know successful business or entrepreneurship sort of career what's your thoughts so let's rewind back when i was in the east running my business it was all about money cash in bank is how I de- is the metric I use to define my success. Success, yeah. Materialistic true. shit was like how yep. I define myself. Um, but I had no life. I was fucking working seven days, mm. and I wasn't happy. So now, for me, the most important metric is how much time I've got to build my lifestyle. Mm. Um, earn very well, but have more time to do what I want when I want. So everything I do now, all the decisions I make, is around is based around my lifestyle. Um, I think my values have just changed. My perspectives change and we're not on this planet for a long time. I think we all think we are, but we're not. And so I'm very conscious of, um, mortality and I, and I'm just, I want to enjoy the day every day and I don't want to be working all day. Mm. I don't think we're put on this planet to work all day. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I, I'm just curious to know what, what moment flicked that perspective? Cause it sounds like, you live in, you were in a, a space on what society deems as successful, and now it seems like you've done the complete three hundred and sixty and realised internally on what is your version of success. Where was the breaking point? I'm not sure if there was a, like a direct breaking point, but it was a, it was a compilation of seeing very successful people in Sydney who typically were working six seven days, mm-hmm. earning really good money, but mate, they just go on one holiday a year mm. or two, and whether I saw them in their 40s or I had met them when they're in their 60s or 70s, I didn't get a good vibe or read that these people had really enjoyed their life. Mm. And good point. I, I think it took me a while just to see that trend mm. and be like, fuck that, I'm, I'm not doing that. Like I'm going to really enjoy my life in my 30s or my late 30s and post that I'm just going to have an incredible life where I just do what I want when I want. And so that's – took me a while to work it out because I was caught in that trap for a long time where I just look forward to one holiday. Now I do like minimum three um, and just have a lot of time during the day. Interesting. So it sounds like the catalyst, because I'm sure people listening are in those shoes at the moment, they're, they're chasing something that probably isn't internally fulfilling, you know? So um, for those kind of people, I mean, that's a really good kind of, perspective would you put it down to just have like what probably back to the start what is it for you is that kind of what it is like you kind of felt what do i want like the free time i wanted or the lifestyle i wanted was it you know what i'm just smiling because i think i started to get really aware around how unhappy people were when i started the institute so what happened was we started bai i started bai and i used to jump on the original sales calls like mm. someone implied and they yeah, wanted yeah. to join. I used to jump on the calls for the first maybe t- 10 months. Yep. What I noticed was, man, people were fucking miserable. Mm. They didn't always hate what they did, but they weren't enjoying their work. 
Previous to that, I, I had no awareness around people just not being happy with work. So I started to realize how unhappy people were. And what I started to then realize was, you know, the fairest thing that we have on this planet, in my opinion, is time. I have the same amount of minutes in the day as Elon Musk, as everyone, Bill Gates. Mm. We've all got the same amount of time. And then what I started to realize was it's the decisions we make around how we spend our time. Mm. The person in the grocery store on this street is probably working just as hard as someone who's making 80x that, that person. They work the same amount of hours. Mm. So you hear about working hard, working hard, working hard. I mean, that's just a fucking given. You want to become the best or whatever. You work hard. Like that's just the ingredient, one of them. So then what I started to realize over time was it's how you make decisions yep. shape the life you build. And if you want to build a lifestyle business like I've got, you've got to work out how do you build products or services or whatever you do that's going to support that. Otherwise, you just get trapped in the other, I guess, pit that you don't want to be in. Mm. Sounds like leverage, first thing that come to mind there, like utilizing your time, swapping it for high, maybe high, you, high leverage activities yeah. or time to, to utilize. Bit of gold there, mate. Um, as we wrap up, mate, I, I just want to say acknowledge, obviously, first of all, yeah, the, just the journey of obviously pivot here, pivot there, you know, and you, you, you went down someone else's version of success and trying to find your own, like um, all in the space of, you know, I consider you still young. You're no, old by no means, not old by no, um, any means. So, mate, it's a real credit to you to, to kind of pivot, um, you know, and, and sort of look down this. I think a lot of people are in that boat, in all honesty. Like if they think internally inside, they're, they're really not happy, but they're chasing something external, some sort of validation or, or something along those lines. So hopefully this app is going to really talk to someone and I think it will. So I appreciate you sharing that insight. Um, mate, as we finish up, I'm curious to know a, a few questions. We'll do a fast five, which we always do. But, mate, what's the legacy piece for you? Like what, what's what's Ben Handler's, where do you want to um, take things over the next decade or however it is? Mate, I haven't thought that far ahead, to be honest. I, If I can just inspire people to live a better life, which I'm doing through BAI, I'm starting to go down that trajectory of just helping people get out of the program of the nine to five and then build something. Like that's big for me because we're not taught, I think, how to become entrepreneurs. Mm. There's a lack of education around when you leave school or at school around what to do. Yeah. So if I can just grow that um, and build that out further, that would be big for me. Mm. What's your definition of success? Just curious to know how much time you can spend in a day doing what the fuck you want yeah. when you want. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And, mate, we always like to finish quick, fast five. Any any location, any dwelling type. I'm curious to know this with your property background. So first first thing that comes to mind, okay, so the first one is um, holiday home. Any location, any dwelling type worldwide. Location for holiday home. I mean, nothing Nothing stems to mind. Like, I think definitely house. Mm -hmm. So definitely land. Yeah. Um, that's for sure. I mean, I've been spending a bit of time in the Gold Coast lately and it feels like, you know, things are starting to shift here. Mm. So I think the Gold Coast, I'm not too familiar around the geography around here, but I've been driving here and just getting a vibe for it and I'm seeing a lot of people shift here. Yeah, and they're, they're, so I, I think Gold Coast, house land. Yeah, love it. Investment property, just blue chip investment. Where would you, where would you park that? You think right now? Well, I'm actually looking to buy one now, so I'm a bit biased. But yeah. I, I'm looking in like I'm, I'm looking Bronte, Tamar, yeah, Eastern um, suburbs, Bondi. It's taken a bit of a retraction, didn't it? Eastern suburbs, so it could be a good opportunity down there if you can support the servicing for it yeah i mean the prestige is very strong there still yeah. like, like i think post five it's 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 super strong um but i just think again bro, like bondi bronte tamar it's so unique mm -hmm. that um super scarce as well eh? super scarce like there's no, you can't build anything anywhere around there that i was blown away when i did the coastal walk 
on just the real estate in the east there, hey. It's like, it's, it's next level, yeah. Next level. Um, mate, what about, um, oh, mate, you're probably there now, but uh, where do you think the forever home is? Man, we fucking love Byron. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what is it for Byron for you? What it's, you it so we're on, we're on six acres yep. in Cooper's. Um, I just love that you can be on, like, you can be at the beach and then 10 minutes you can be in the country. Mm. Like, that's, that's where we are. Like, in, in, it feels like, you know, there's very large properties where we are. So, I mean, I, I don't see us leaving leaving there. I think if anything, like, I'd, I'd probably, if anything, maybe just move overseas mm. and just try something different. But in Australia, like, Byron's where it's at. We've got a good eye. <sighs> Same in the Gold Coast. I mean, I think... And we, yeah. We, we, I think up north, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, hectic. And, mate, just lastly, I always like to finish on what's... What's your biggest add value to any buyers right now coming on the back end of 2023? I think you want to stop asking people around when the market's going to, you know, when the market's going to change. Cause I get asked all the time, like, Hey, I'm just like, man, I, I'm lying to you. If I give you an answer, like, I don't know. Yeah. So I think, I think you want to, you probably want to start to understand, I think, cause supply is a bit of an issue at the moment. I'm hearing it just in most places, yeah. supply, supply, supply. Yeah. A tip is like, if you're looking to buy in a very, very low supply area, you just need to make sure you're not paying over. Because if you're in an area where there's very limited supply and there's only like the few properties, there's going to be a lot of bids on it, a lot of people on it. And I am seeing some people overpay mm. from what I'm hearing on properties mm -hmm. in that regard. So I think if you can, you want to open it up potentially to somewhere where there's a bit more supply. If you can, if it meets your, your brief, um, so you're not just pigeonholed into an area where there's going to be a ton of buyers just bidding for something. Mm. Um, and I'd also say be patient as well. Mm. I don't think there's a rush to buy. Mm. That's a good point, eh? I had a chat to some first home buyers yesterday and yeah, it's just like crazy, isn't it? Like with, with property, like it, it is. The best times always, you know, the property's always going up. You're buying blue chip, good areas. So yeah, the best time yesterday, but... Also, don't put so much pressure, eh, to, to rush in. Like, these first home, I was thought they were, like, trying to leverage everything and, go, like, just – and they had good jobs. And it's just like, well, if you just steady up a bit, like, your you cash deposits, if any, it's going to keep growing as well. Like, so I always say that as well. Like, obviously, it's it's always a good time to buy, but don't – don't stress. Don't put too much pressure on yourself, eh, to, to live this – like, you, when you get a house, you're going to be somewhat, like, successful or something, right? Yeah. I mean, you can understand though, like if rates go up again and, and their loan, their pre-approval expires, obviously mm. their serviceability can be affected and so their loan value goes down. Mm. But I agree with you. Like you just don't want to, unless you have to buy, mm. like you have to buy for whatever reason, as you said, like just you, you need to relax with the pressure. Yeah. Um, and just stay really, I think, diligent and yeah. patient around finding that, that exact asset yeah. that you want to buy. Because that's what I feel. When the pressure valves on, people do crappy buys. Yeah. They get buyer's remorse and buyer's fatigue and then they buy something that just either overpaid or, you know, they're not even enjoying it. So you're exactly right. Well, mate, absolute wisdom there. I really enjoyed that. Uh, few fronts, the buyer's agency world, um, you know, shifting the mentality around getting support to buy property. Really love it. And then, yeah, just some real insight on what it takes, I think, to, to live the life that you you deserve and you, you want yourself. So, mate, uh, really appreciate you coming on into the Gold Coast. Thanks, mate. Really, good, really enjoyed it. Thanks, bro.